what we do, we take a decision on an instrument by instrument level, but a business model is not applied at an instrument level, is normally applied at a portfolio level. And insurance companies often analyze their portfolios, uh, again, based on the fact that whether or not those portfolios are held to support a particular line of insurance contracts or not. So the insurance contracts which are held uh, under respective business models will be valued accordingly. And therefore, you can have a different measurement basis on different debt portfolios depending on the business model for which they are held. Uh, I think that's something we already discussed that those debt instruments which are not simple debt instruments but which are actually providing you return other than the interest and the principal will have to be fair value through PL account regardless of your business model test. So we will first bifurcate all those debt instruments which are not simple instruments and will fair value through PL account. And maybe I think in Pakistan we will have rare situations of those kind of instruments because our debt market is not very matured at this point in time. We mostly have simple debt instruments in terms of the TFCs and which provide uh, usually only the principal and interest in return. So the business model test is, uh, as I said, is a portfolio level test and which actually have to be aligned with the way you manage your contractual liabilities under the insurance contracts. And depending on uh, whether those portfolios are held to collect full cash flows or to collect and sell, uh, they can either be carried at amortized cost or fail valued. Now, talking about debt instruments, uh, there is also a big change, which is perhaps not as big for an insurance companies because Insurance companies are not in the business of giving loans directly to the customers, like the banks. Uh, and the banks are actually facing a lot of impact of IFRS 9 because of the change in the impairment model uh, on debt instruments, the way you measure the impairment on debt instruments. Insurance companies also uh, can have that impact because you, uh, insurance companies also have debt portfolios. And the impairment on those, those debt portfolios have to be measured as well under the IFRS 9 model. What happens currently is that, you know, if you have a debt portfolio, you make a provision or a loan loss provision when there is a default on that debt instrument. And based on that default, you start making a provision. Now that is called an incurred loss model, which means the default, uh, it, is, it captures the provision from the date of occurrence of impairment or a default. Whereas on IFRS 9, uh, there is a model which is called expected loss model. So the provision should begin from the day one you, you, ho you, you invest in a debt instrument based on the expectation of loss. Now the expectation of loss, uh, how you calculate the expectation of loss, how you determine the loan provisions on the expectation of loss on a debt portfolio uh, is a very complex methodology, particularly when you're dealing with, with, with banks but it is, is relatively simpler when you're dealing with debt instruments because debt instruments uh, are uh, normally rated by third parties. They are rating agencies which, are, which actually provide rating or, of those debt instruments. Th there are published uh, statistics about the probability of defaults on those debt instruments and which can be taken into account while determining what is the expected loss on those debt instruments. But the change which will happen is uh, that for your debt investment portfolio, which are carried at amortized cost or fair value through OCI, from the day one, uh, the insurance companies would start uh, measuring the loan losses or debt impairment losses on the expected loss model and start building the provisions against those debt instruments which will uh, be a PNL impact in terms of those debt instruments. I will just briefly cover, uh, I will not go into the very details of how the expected loss model work, but because I think it has a wider uh, uh, implications for a banking industry rather than insurance companies, but still I think to just touch on the concept, uh, you, what you do is you divide your whole debt instrument portfolio into three stages or categories. Stage one is your high quality debt instruments, which actually very low risk of default. 
stage two is those do debt instruments where the credit risk is more than normal, which is the credit risk which are not investment grade. So the first category you can take investment grade instruments and the second category are non-investment grade instruments where the credit risk has increased after you invested into that instrument. And the third category is the stage three, which is like your NPL or a defaulted debt instrument. So the defaulted debt instrument, you currently also make a provision. You will also continue making a provision on those defaulted debt instrument. But stage one and stage two, investment grade and non-investment grade, where the credit risk has increased uh, after the time you purchase those instruments, you have to determine what is the expected loss on those instruments in terms of their credit risk. And that expected loss has to be reflected in terms of provision uh, from uh, in, in your financial statements, regardless of the fact that those debt instruments have not defaulted. So there is some incremental loss which will, uh, which will arise as a result of implementing this expected loss model uh, as regards the debt instruments is concerned. So the way I think normally it is done for debt instruments is because they are rated by third parties. So as the credit rating uh, uh, changes uh, and, and, it, and, and the credit rating is downgraded by the credit rating agencies, the instruments are moved from stage one to stage two. And as a result, you have an incremental effect on your provisioning. So uh, I think this is the, uh, what you do is how you calculate the expected loss is a function of probability of default, loss giving default, and exposure of default. You need to predict three things. What is the chances what are the chances that a debt instrument will go into default, which is called probability of default? Second, you have to predict if it goes into default, how much loss, how much of the cash shortfall it will result, which is called loss giving default, because not the entire instrument uh, perhaps uh, will be lost and not the entire set of cash flows uh, will, be, uh, will, uh, will, be, uh, will be lost by the by the investor, but there will be certain recoveries as well. So what will be the loss giving default? And the third, what will be the exposure at the point in time? What is the outstanding balance when the default will occur? So you predict what is the percentage of probability of default, multiply it by loss giving default, and multiply it by the exposure at default to arrive at the expected credit loss model. I think many of the actuaries sitting in the room are very familiar with the expected loss methodology, so it will not be a big uh, challenge for them to come up with the expected loss on the debt instruments, uh, taking into account the ratings available, etc. But I think here the purpose is to just to warn you that on the debt portfolios, uh, there's maybe certain impairment provisions coming uh, on the expected loss basis uh, rather than waiting till the time the default occurs. Okay. So, uh, in summary, if you look at the investment portfolios that insurance companies have, what I've done is that uh, these are the, based on the statistics of major uh, insurance companies that we have in Pakistan, which represent almost 80% of the assets of the industry. So only, uh, if you look at the life business, we have predominantly investments sitting in the AFS portfolio. There are certain health or trading portfolios as well, 24%, and there are uh, held to maturity portfolios, 67% of the total portfolios in the live business because I think uh, we have also counted state life. So state life, a lot of annuities and, uh, you know, fixed liabilities, and they have held to maturity portfolios to match perhaps those liabilities. But general, I think 90% of the portfolios are AFS, which are currently carried at lower of cost and market values. And when you implement the new regulations, 2017 insurance accounting regulations, they will have to be fair valued through comprehensive income. And you'll, when you will move into IFRS 9, the gain and losses sitting in the comprehensive income will remain in comprehensive income, will not be recycled to the PNL account. That is a change which will come in 2021. And at that time, perhaps you will have a choice to also think about fair value through PNL option if some companies want to go for that option 
if they want to take the gains on investment to the PNL. Uh, the dividend income will go into the PNL as usual, as currently, and also under IFRS 9. So, AFS portfolios actually, uh, because I think their health for trading portfolios are not substantial. Uh, in fact, they are minimal. So, uh, the, in, in terms of the business impact, the insurance companies would have to determine what is the business model for their different investment portfolios before implementing IFRS 9. Think about whether they want to exercise fair value option depending on uh, the kind of insurance liabilities that they have. In case of life business, I think that is a choice uh, which is uh, perhaps inevitable for life insurance product which are unit linked where there's a cash value provided and certainly uh, fair value through PNL is currently also uh, used as per the regulation and will be an option again under IFRS 9. Amortized cost basis. Uh, for amortized cost basis, a business model test has to be applied. For those debt instruments which an insurer wants to carry at amortized cost, they have to demonstrate that those instruments are held to collect all the contractual cash flows. And there's a business model why they want to collect all the contractual cash flows, like they have a uh, fixed contractual liability under the insurance contract, and they have to match that liability with the cash flows from those debt instruments. So there's a business model which requires the insurance companies to collect all the contractual cash flows, and if this business model justifies, only then amortized cost basis can be used for debt instruments. Uh, so it's, it's a choice which can be exercised based on the way it is managed in the business. It's not a choice that you do, it's not an accounting choice that we perform under IS 39 that, you know, we can carry at uh, the instrument under held to maturity category or AFS and the way we decide or the intent of the management. It's not the intent of the management, it's the business model which is a fact, which is not based on intentions, which can be demonstrated and which is easy to audit as well for auditors sitting in this room. So life is easy because it's extremely difficult to audit the intents because in many of the cases, I think we uh, find ourselves in a very difficult position when some company claims that this is an AFS portfolio, this is not held for trading. And then next year you find trading happening to some extent and the gains are actually taken to the PNL account through realized gain process. And you, when you challenge that, I think uh, they will come back to you and, 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 uh, and, and put forward the same argument. But while our intent is not the trading, our intent is that we want to carry them for medium term gains and uh, dividend yields and et cetera. And the standard uses the term intent. So the auditors have to go with the intent of the management as well. So, uh, so, so that's, uh, that, is, uh, that is something which will change under IFRS 9. It has to be based on the business model, which can be demonstrated. And, and also, very, very important, the solvency requirements. Now, in Pakistan, the accounting uh, values are the values which are reflected in the solvency computations as well. So if you carry certain instruments at amortized cost, you will have to uh, forego the fair value advantage in the solvency requirements as well. So I think that is also one of the considerations that the insurance companies have, uh, that in order to have a high solvency margin, or in order to meet the solvency requirements, uh, they may be inclined to, f to follow a fair value approach, a fair value accounting approach, because currently the way the regulations work is that the accounting values are taken in the solvency uh, calculations. If they change in the future, and I believe they should, because the solvency uh, purposes, uh, sh uh, maybe I think a different approach may be taken rather than the, just carrying forward the accounting values. I think if that happens, certainly the accounting model will not be impacted by the solvency consideration, but till the time it happens, I think this is one of the fundamental considerations as well, uh, whether or not a company wants to choose for a fair value option, uh, because if uh, because they will not be able to avail uh, a fair value advantage in the solvency if they choose to treat something at cost uh, in their uh, balance sheets. 
uh, an impairment of depth instruments, I think this is a certain impact which may also come when you implement IFRS 9. So this is in brief about IFRS 9. So I think thank you very much in case you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's a very, very clear presentation. Uh, just one, one comment. Uh, you know, a lot of the assets that are carried for life companies, so I'm not talking about non-life and life, they carry it within what we call statutory funds, the life yeah. funds. And there's no concept of equity there. I suppose the fund value is part of equity. So a lot of the gains and losses that would realize, so uh, revaluations that take place, would be within statutory funds, right? Yeah. So when you say take to OCI in those cases, uh, where does it go? Well, I think the statutory fund mechanism and the revenue account mechanism itself is not an IFRS model. So uh, now, I believe this is changing again, because if you implement the new regulations, the, the statutory funds will be uh, part of the equity or a policyholder's liabilities, depending on, because they have components of both. And then obviously, when you uh, fair value through OCI, uh, they are going to remain within those, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the component of the statutory fund, which, uh, which is classified as equity. So uh, it's, it's, it's not going to come to the PNL or revenue account anyways. So if the question is that, because we have to decide also what is the status of the statutory fund. If the statutory fund, whether it meets the definition of an equity or a liability, Certain part of it certainly is a liability, a policyholder's liability, and there is an element of retained profits, et cetera, which is, uh, which is an equity component. And when you actually classify them according to their features, equity and liability, then to the extent the investments are held within the business unit uh, 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 of, of that particular, for example, investment-linked fund, then gain and losses will go to that uh, equity component. If I, if I can just comment, uh, let's take state life, that's going to be the biggest uh, impact I think that will have, and there were a lot of arguments at that stage when we were developing this. Uh, they've, got, they've got within the statutory fund, there is the policy liability, the two accounts which are called ledger accounts A, B, in which state yeah. life pa would park the unrealized and distributed gains, but they don't distribute to policyholders. Now, right. both A and B for the time being are classified as policy liabilities. Right, okay. so if you took them to equity, then you would basically say that you increase, so if you revalue, in, uh, say, uh, equities, uh, AFS equities, you revalue, so yeah. that revaluation, so you debit the, the investment because value goes up, so yeah. you credit statutory fund A and B, so you yeah. increase liabilities, right? So you would not have any impact. Uh, uh, on the, just but, but if those uh, liabilities are linked to those investments. In the case of state tax, they're not there, the convention, as you correctly said, a lot of the reason they have held to maturity type debt instruments is because they have guaranteed, uh, they, guaranteed the annuity, they have guaranteed liabilities. So for, for them, maybe, uh, I think uh, the, the ch they, they may choose then to follow amortized cost model rather than revalue. Uh, for equities. Okay, for equities. Then for equities, I think certainly uh, there will be, I think, an upside on the balance sheet uh, just to bring the balance sheet closer to the fair valuation. But... <laughs> Very uh, interestingly, in, in, in India, this, they've had this requirement for a long time, and the Life Insurance Corporation of India, which is the correspondent to, but huge, it's uh, you know, 100 times the size of state life, uh, what it did is revalued all this investment and created a liability on the balance sheet. Just, <laughs> they, they actually just capitalized it and kept it but, as a liability but, on the balance sheet. But, but interesting thing is, why you have equity portfolios to support fixed liabilities? Uh, they, they, they're not fixed because there is some discretion in terms of the bonus mechanism. So the whole idea is to have a small equity portfolio to give a uh, long-term better return to policyholders. That's the, All right. so it's not a huge part of the portfolio, but it's there. <laughs> no questions, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Arslan Khalid for uh, such a wonderful presentation. Uh, Mr. Arslan Khalid, I think will not be available in the second uh, half. So I would request uh, Mr. Noman, no president of Pakistan Society of Factories to please come on stage and distribute a shield to Mr. Arsalan Khalid uh, as a token of appreciation. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for uh, lunch and namaz uh, time, oh, uh, break. Uh, 
I think the lunch has been served. Uh, we are already 30 minutes, uh, we have already exceeded 30 minutes. So I would request everyone to please come back uh, by 2.15 so that we can uh, restart. Uh, we have uh, pr a panel discussion as well and uh, a number of presentation. Uh, for namaz area, uh, the, for, for, for males, uh, the namaz area is by the poolside and for females, uh, we have arranged uh,